So, welcome everyone to tonight's Merton Conversation, entitled, The Real Science Behind CSI. It's a very great pleasure to welcome you here to the Royal Institution. For me, this is one of the kind of the great cathedrals of science in the world. Michael Faraday and Humphrey Davy worked here. Ten of the chemical elements were discovered here. Fifteen Nobel Prize winners were associated with the Royal Institution. And on a kind of more personal note, I think it was our, our Christmases at home were always dominated by the Royal Institution Christmas lectures. We sort of had, had to eat our meals around it, so it had a great impact on us. Turning now to Merton, just about everyone in this room, I think, will be aware that 2014 is the 750th anniversary of the foundation of our college. We're now moving towards the end of our epic year, and tonight's conversation is the last in a series of six Merton Conversations. As you will all know, there is an endless discussion as to which is the oldest college in Oxford. Is it Univ, Balliol, or Merton? We all have some claim to this, though I have to confess I am unclear to exactly what the claims of Balliol and Univ are. <laughs> but one thing we do know for certain is that Merton's statutes have served as a template for other colleges through time and throughout the world. And we are immensely proud of this. In the course of this anniversary year, we've put together a very full and varied programme. And the intention behind all of this is to draw together the Merton family. And when I say the Merton family, I mean our fellows, our students, our staff, our alumni, and of course, our friends. We have celebrated not only with a special birthday weekend, a summer ball, and many very excellent musical events, but also by discussing across the world some of the great global issues of our time in this unique series called The Merton Conversations. But before I come to tonight's two discussants and the moderator, I should just like to give you an update on the other an equally important aspect of our anniversary, namely the 750th anniversary campaign. As the Mertonians amongst you will know, our campaign target has been £30 million. And we need this to help secure the college's future into, into, as we move forward. And I want to thank you all for your very generous support, which has enabled us to reach this very challenging target. And this will enable us just to remind you to strengthen the tutorial system, to support our students, and to protect and resource the college's historic buildings. I should, though, mention that we still have a little way to go in some aspects of the campaign, so we're not quite over. Especially, I'm thinking of areas such as undergraduate student support, the law fellowship, and also the poor college's boathouse. You only need to walk by it to see why it's in need. Now, this said, I want to thank you all very warmly indeed. In particular, the nearly 3,000 alumni and friends all over the world who have helped Merton reach this £30 million target. And that is actually before the due date. We have been working towards December 2014. And I was thrilled to pieces that the money was declared in on the Friday just before the birthday weekend. It's wonderful timing. Now, in particular, I want to thank the previous warden, and I have to say, with all the lights shining on me, I can't see where you are, Jessica. Where is she? Yeah, there we are. There, so I've got you now, as they say. Yeah, I want to thank Jessica, because in the three brief years when, it's, when the campaign started, she raised the magnificent sum of £13.4 million. Pounds. And this meant, then, that when I came in, which I had just shy, really, of half the target in the bag already. And that was a wonderful thing for me to start. Just give Jessica a round of applause. Thank you. So let me now return to the Merton Conversations. So altogether, there are six of them. Had one in New York, four in the United Kingdom, and one in New York, or one in Hong Kong, and one in New York. They cover, as I mentioned, some of the 21st century's key issues. 
So we began in Hong Kong in January with the challenges of global finance. We then picked up again with China in our second conversation, this time in Oxford in February, with the topic China and the West, culture and society. We then moved on to New York in April to discuss the global media revolution. And our next discussion was in May at the Royal Society with the topic being the two cultures of CP Snow. And then last and most recently, our conversation was on liberty at the BAFTA Theatre. As I said, tonight we have the real science behind CSI, and this will be then the last in the Merton Conversation series. Of course, I want to express my very great thanks to Alec, Bernard and Michael for being here with us tonight. Michael Ritbath is our moderator, and presently I think, Michael, you're going to introduce Alec and Bernard, so it remains my job, therefore, is to introduce you. That's, what, that's the, the, what's left. I am delighted, Michael, to welcome you. You came up to Merton in 1979 and gained a first-class honours degree in modern history. Michael has had an exceptionally interesting and varied career. He was, first of all, eight years as a bond trader in the city of London, and then, really very unusually, in his last year at a venture capital firm, he wrote his first financial thriller, Free to Trade. Five further financial thrillers followed that first one. And his most recent works are crime novels which feature an Icelandic detective called Magnus Jonsson. And I have to tell you, my summer holiday is not complete without my <laughs> Michael Ridpath. They're, t they're a terrific read. I'm, and there's no commission or anything. It's just, it's just, it's just an honest comment. No. <laughs> To finish on a personal note, though, I shall be eternally grateful to Michael for his help when we were recruiting our finance bursar when Cliff Reb was going to retire. I'm looking at Michael in the eyes for this one. His advice was golden, and I shall be, I shall be sort of grateful for the rest of my life for the help that you gave us. So on this very happy note, ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause to your, your moderator, Michael Ridbath. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, and this is an absolutely wonderful room to be, to be having this conversation in. Um, Merton College and crime scenes go together, <laughs> which would be obvious if you went to the gym in the afternoon. Now, I have the fortunate, I'm fortunate enough to have the sort of job which allows me to go to the gym in the afternoon, and if you do that, you see three screens, or four. On the first one might be Wonga. The second one, they're trying to sell you a damp cottage in Derbyshire or something. And the third one will have rather fetching shots of an Oxford college. And that, of course, is the reruns of either Morse or Lewis. And so the first thing you do is try and figure out which college it is and is it Merton. And half the time it is. I, I don't know why so many of them are Merton, but they are. And if it's Merton, there's normally an actor lying in fellows quad or mob quad trying not to shiver. And then if you're looking at an old Morse, then John Thorpe will sort of saunter up to him, give him a kick to see if he's alive. And then just check his, you know, skin to see how long he's been dead. He might say, this, this man's been dead 10 minutes. Now, if you're looking at a more modern Lewis, Kevin Watley will be dressed up in a plastic bag. And he'll be chatting up a blonde forensic um, medical examiner dressed up, chest up in a plastic bag with crime scene and people crawling around with tweezers. So you can see from this television representation that forensics has really moved on a lot in the last 20 years. <laughs> Now, now, fiction used to be ahead of reality. If you think of Sherlock Holmes, whenever he wasn't solving cases, he was doing original forensic research on, you know, with his microscope on identifying snuff or tobacco or gunpowder. Um, Father Brown was quite good at footprints, but it really went downhill with Miss Marple, who was frankly rubbish at forensics. <laughs> and it's not until you get to um, Patricia Cornwell, who was a real-life medical examiner, who wrote gory bloody but quite accurate depictions of crime scene investigations from a forensic point of view, that the novels and the TV world really got forensics between its teeth. And this blossomed, um, <laughs> leading to its apogee in the American TV series CSI, in which forensic scientists of outstanding natural beauty 
<laughs> solve crimes in beautifully lit spacious laboratories with computers with amazing graphics and CGI which work first time. Um, and the police don't really get a look in apart from to mess up the crime scenes from time to time. <laughs> so we're going to find out if that's really how um, the CSI world is. Um, now, here we come to the really remarkable thing. You'd expect an institution merchandised if they wanted to have a chat about forensics. They maybe have a bloke whose wife worked in a forensics lab and maybe a woman whose father used to be a detective. But this being Merton, <laughs> we've got the Mertonian who discovered DNA fingerprinting and DNA profiling, and the Mertonian who is the current commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. So we have an absolutely fascinating conversation ahead of us. Now, Professor Jeffries' childhood was one of scalpels and chemistry sets, of dissecting bumblebees, explosions, and splashed sulfuric acid. Merton spotted his potential and awarded him a postmastership to read biochemistry. There he developed an interest in genetics, and the subject of his PhD thesis at Oxford was studies on the mitochondria of cultured mammalian cells. From Oxford, he moved to the University of Amsterdam and then to the Department of Genetics at the University of Leicester, where he remained for the rest of his career. Until his recent retirement, he held the positions of Professor of Genetics and Royal Society Wolfson Research Professor. In 1986, he was elected to the Royal Society. In 1994, he was knighted. He has received the Louis Jantet Prize for Medicine, the Lasker Award, the Heineken Award, the Heineken Prize. I don't know if that comes with beer, but no. <laughs> Sadly, no. <laughs> Louis Jantet isn't a make of champagne, is it? No. no. Um, and he was awarded uh, this year the Royal Society's oldest and most prestigious award, the Copley Medal, and we think this might be the oldest award of its kind for any scientific um, institution worldwide. He's also an honorary fellow of Merton College. But I get the impression that what Professor Jeffrey's three decades at the University of Leicester really allowed him to do is spend his time in his laboratory discovering things. And that is what we're going to talk to him about this evening. Now, Sir Bernard Hogan Howe. Sir Bernard was born and brought up in Sheffield. After leaving school, he worked as a lab technician for the National Health Service before joining South Yorkshire Police at the age of 22. I think there have been uh, a few uh, mature, high-flying police officers who've gone to Merton to study law, and uh, Sir Bernard was one of these, arriving at Merton to study jurisprudence at the age of 28. He subsequently gained a diploma in advanced criminology and an MBA from Sheffield University. In 1999, he moved on to Liverpool, first as assistant chief constable for Merseyside, and then after a stint at the Met as chief constable. There, he targeted gun crime, binge drinking, and the use of stolen and uninsured vehicles. The result was a reduction of crime by a third, antisocial behavior by 26%, and the largest haul of criminal assets recovered outside London. In 2009, he was appointed Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary, and in 2011, he was given the most prestigious and probably the most difficult job in British policing, the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. He has been awarded the Queen's Police Medal and last year a knighthood. He has honorary doctorates in law from uh, the Universities of Sheffield Hallam and Sheffield and is an honorary fellow of Merton as well. But he's still a policeman. While being interviewed on BBC Radio earlier this year in Tottenham, he broke away to pursue a passenger who'd done a runner from a minicab without paying. <laughs> <laughs> he caught him. <laughs> so if any of you are planning to nick that nice looking handbag down there, don't. Now, uh, my first question is uh, for Alec, and I'm going to ask it in the manner of a detective from one of my novels. Professor Jeffries, tell us where you were at 9.05 a.m. on the 10th of September 1984, and what were you doing? Right, well, perhaps before I answer that, that, that question, can I just say I'm totally unqualified to be sitting here, because I've never seen a single episode of CSR in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not too sure what the basis of all this is. But, OK, what was I doing at uh, five minutes past nine on the uh, morning of Monday, 10th of September, 1984? Yep. I was in the uh, Department of Genetics dark room, uh, developing a piece of X-ray film. And purely by accident, on that X-ray film was the world's very first DNA fingerprint. Now, I should stress that at no stage we ever attempted or, or deliberately set about 
to come up with a DNA-based method of biological identification. It was a complete glorious accident. So I remember, as if it were yesterday, standing in this very small dark room, you take the little bit of uh, X-ray film out of the uh, fixing tank, and then you switch the light on. And what I could see was a sort of fuzzy barcode mess. And I thought, right. that's complicated. I'm not too sure what's going on here. And now on that first bit of X-ray film, we have uh, one of my technicians and a mother and a father. And I could see the barcodes of those three people were different from each other. And also, there seemed to be a simple pattern of inheritance with the, with the pattern of the technician being a composite of information from a mother and from a father. So the penny almost immediately Did dropped. you see that right away? 30 seconds. Really? It right. took me to spot it. So I could see, right, this in theory was a method for biological identification and for sorting out family relationships. Now, again, totally by accident on that first bit of X-ray film, we had not only my technician and a mother and a father, but we also had, and I can't remember exactly what was on it, I think we had a cow, a mouse, <laughs> a rat, right. a lemur, um, we had tobacco DNA, I do remember that, and virtually everything worked. So here was a method for biological identification, not just on humans, but basically any higher organism. And as I say, the penny dropped in about 30 seconds. Right. And then what happened then was I just got wildly overexcited, overexcited <laughs> totally hard, <laughs> that's right. So I remember charging out into the lab, saying, Vicky, and Vicky was my, my uh, uh, technician who'd be helping me with this, I, th I think we're onto something really exciting. Right. So uh, within the hour, we sort of brainstormed our way through what we might be able to do with this technology if we can improve it, because that right. first set of DNA fingerprints, I haven't got the film with me, but just take the word on it, it fuzzy, horrible mess, all right. blotchy and horrible. Right. Doesn't matter, I could see what was going on in there. So we could see forensic identification almost immediately. We could see uh, paternity disputes uh, being resolved using this. We could see non-human applications, wildlife crime conservation biology, biodiversity analysis, studies of evolution, just this huge, long list of things with doors opening all over. And no one had guessed that this... No. Th that right. Everybody today knows that what do you do with DNA? You catch criminals with Right. We all know that. Yeah. It's bloody obvious, right? <laughs> but at that point, it wasn't on anybody's radar. It simply had not crossed any mind, anybody's mind, that you could unite this bizarre new field of human molecular genetics, that's looking directly at yeah. the DNA, uh, with criminal investigations. Uh, I mean, just to give you an example of how ridiculous that was at the time, um, about a month later, I stood up at a lunch club at, uh, in my department, and I gave them a seminar on the biology of the bits of DNA that we're looking at. And I said, look, this is how these work. They're highly variable bits of DNA. They're highly discriminating. These are just like DNA fingerprints, they individualize. And then I speculated that maybe, for example, we could catch rapists, identify rapists using semen recovered from rape victims. And I'm not exaggerating, the, about a quarter of the audience just burst out laughing. Oh. Jeffries had totally lost the <laughs> plot. This was ludicrous. You, you can't use DNA right. in that sort of right. context. And I showed them wrong. Right. <laughs> so how did, how did someone realize that they could use it, other than you, that they could use it to solve a real case? Well, how, how, did that, how did the science get from your laboratory to right, the outside out world? To the world. Well, the, one word, press, the press. Right. Okay. So what happened? This was September 84. By the end of 1984, we'd improved the technology to the point where we, we knew this was going to work. Right. This could really be applied to real-world application. And my guess is that it would take perhaps 5, 10, 20 years before we would ever move it out of an academic lab into real-world casework. I couldn't be more wrong. So by the end of the year, uh, we filed patents on this. We had um, written and submitted the first scientific publication. That was published in March. It was then picked up by a lawyer in London representing a very, very uh, a family involved in a very difficult immigration dispute. And she picked the paper up because it had been reported in The Guardian right. by, by a journalist called Andrew Veach. Bless him. Right. Okay, so he'd writ written up a little yeah. bit in The Guardian, yeah. uh, building on our speculation at the end of the scientific paper that you know, maybe you could use it for looking at family yeah. relationships and so on. Um, she read this and thought, ah, 
maybe we can apply it in this really, really tricky immigration case. Right. So this is a, a case that's been through all the traditional blood group typing, and it hadn't worked. I mean, it, basically, the, the dispute was about a young lad who was threatened with deportation because he's not believed to be a member of this family. The blood group typing said he probably was some sort of relative to the family, but the Home Office really worried that this lad was a nephew to the family, not a son right. to the family. Okay. So anyway, the, the uh, lawyer got in contact with us, and I said, look, we'll take it on. Most of the key family members, like the father, are completely missing, but we'll give it a try. And it worked. That right. was, in fact, the very first. So contrary to a lot of sort of common misconception that you go from the lab straight into forensic investigations, no. There was a big history of civil application before that. Right. And the very first case was that immigration dispute. That was the first case anywhere on the planet right. to, to deploy DNA. And it had a good result. Oh, it was fabulous. Right. It was just, it was, it, well, what we, what we showed was this I mean, boy, did you meet the boy? Yes, right. indeed. And the mother, who had yeah. been through a lot of grief in this yeah. whole process. So I met these people down at the Immigration Tribunal. We'd submitted... Uh, the DNA evidence. I mean, poor old Home Office had never heard of DNA. Yes. <laughs> so it didn't really fit in the civil service it just, template, did it? It blew every <laughs> fuse that they yeah, had. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so they had all these sort of Home Office statisticians scratching their heads over, you know, what on earth is this all about? So they, they took the decision simply to drop the case against the boy rather than argue the case right. and establish some sort of quasi legal precedence yeah. for the admissibility of DNA. They just dropped it. And I was there when they made that decision. And so if I was ever asked, what was the golden moment in the whole of the, the story of DNA fingerprinting? It, well, the moment was the moment the mother was told. And the right. look in her eyes. She'd been fighting this for two years. And the look of gratitude and relief that a boy was with her for good. Yeah. Fabulous. Yes. And so this was science beating bureaucracy, beating the Home Office, and rescuing young lads from deportation. And getting, Doesn't get better yeah, than that. Yeah. And getting from lab yeah. to the real world without going through clinical trials or all those other sort of it's quick. obstacles. It's just, the way. It, I mean, as you say, mostly it takes 10, 15, 20 years to yeah, do it. Yeah, that's right. It was just amazingly quick. So very brief history. So the, the first, we took on that first case in April 1985, just a few months after the first DNA fingerprint. The Immigration Tribunal, I think, was in June 85. We'd taken on the first paternity case uh, which was presented to us because of the huge amount of publicity that we got from the immigration case. That was in the summer of 1985, and then the first murder investigation, criminal investigation, that was right at the end of 1985, early 86. So it was just a whirlwind. And why was it so quick? It's because we hadn't realized that there was this desperate demand out there for a method of biological identification that could give not proof positive, we never do that in science, yeah. but a level of certainty went beyond anything that had ever been seen before, certainly in the forensic arena. So very exciting. And so what was the first case that came, the first murder case that came to you? Right. Um, and how did it come? I mean, did a police okay. sort of wander in the door? Or? Just about, yes. So um, th this, this was actually... <laughs> right, th 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 this was actually a, a, I mean, a really tragic case. It was local to Leicestershire. Right. Uh, it was two young schoolgirls, one of whom had been raped and murdered in 1983, and the second in 1986. And then short after, shortly after that second murder, a young man was arrested, uh, put in police custody, and he was uh, he fully confessed to that second murder. Now, the pattern of the two murders was so similar that the police thought whoever done the second must have done the first murder as well. So, so they had seen... They knew a bit about DNA. They'd heard about all this publicity from the immigration and paternity cases. So it was, I think, it was literally a phone call right. from a local constabulary right. saying, look, have you heard about this so-called Enderby murder case? And I had. I mean, it was big news at yeah. the time. And so they explained the situation that, that they got the killer. They simply wanted to tie him into the, the first murder. So they asked, could I tackle it? And I said, well, we'll give it a go, but nobody has ever attempted this. Do not expect any results. I thought it was going to fail miserably. So we received the, the forensic samples from them. So our mission was to simply confirm guilt with respect to the second murder mm -hmm. and to tie this young man into the first murder. Mm -hmm. So we went through it. And the, now, the typing technology in those days has come on a long way. So this was slow. So the first result, I think it took us about four or five days for the pattern to come through. And that was a result from the first victim. 
Right. And we compared that profile with the, the young man in custody, complete mismatch. Right. So I thought, okay, it looks like police have got this wrong, that, that, that they can't tie him in. And by that stage, it was obvious to you that it was a complete mismatch? Well, I'll come back to that okay, in a sorry. second, because <laughs> it, it looked... So then we had to wait another week before we could tease out that very faint profile from the second victim. Right. And that was a big shock moment, right. because the semen DNA profile from both those victims was indistinguishable. And it's completely different from this young man who confessed to the, the second murder. All right. So, so conclusion, there were two possible conclusions. First, this guy was innocent. It was a false confession. Of both murders. Both. Yeah. Or second, there was something horribly wrong with the science. Right. And that was what yeah. I earnestly believed instinctively, right. that the science was kaput. Right. We got the whole thing just hideously wrong. So we did additional testing. At that point, we passed on the technology to forensic colleagues in the home office. They got some of our samples. They did testing as well. Everything pointed to the DNA telling the truth and this young man having given a false confession. So basically, the, the police are then left with the, the horrendous problem of, first of all, having a young man in custody from whom they had wrought the false confession, uh, so they did, after due deliberation, they let this young man go. And I'm pretty sure that given the confession and a bit of circumstantial evidence, were it not for DNA, that young man would have been convicted and probably gone to jail for the rest of his life. So the first time DNA was ever used in anger in a criminal investigation was not to prove guilt, it was to establish innocence. Right. What the police then did was something, and the due credit to Chief Superintendent David Baker, Right. There was a guy in charge of this operation. He, because his initial reaction was, oh, I just don't believe this DNA. That's just a ridiculous right. result. <laughs> he then said, right, we're going to believe it. So we've now got the DNA profile of the, the true assailant, and we're pretty sure he's a local chap. So we'll launch what proved to be the world's first DNA-based manhunt. We will ask voluntarily for blood samples from the entire local community within the three villages that lay at the heart of this investigation. And so they got, uh, they put out requests, 5,511 blood samples, please give them to us. And in fact, they received 5,510. Incredible right. take up. Right. The 5,511th refused on religious grounds. Right. He was not inculpated in any way in that, uh, in that uh, murder. Now, was that voluntary? This is a very interesting social experiment because the initial take up was about 80% response. 80% of the young men were coming forward and giving samples. The remaining 20% were then the subject of horrendous gossip, and then you <laughs> ended down the pub. So they were all basically by peer pressure. That, you know, you're going to get lynched or you go down and, yeah. and give a blood sample. Quite remarkable. And anyway, that, that mass is called the blooding, and there's right. a book actually written on this. Right. Joseph Wombaugh, one of the, the leading oh, yeah. US crime writers, he's written the whole thing up. All right. Well, what's well, it called? The Blooding by the Joseph blooding, Wombat, right. XLAPD. Well worth having a look at. So, um, so the, the trail went cold at that point because they'd scanned these 5,511 people and not a single match. And in fact, what had happened was a true perpetrator knew that he was in the firing line. If he gave a blood sample, he would be caught. So he got his mate to stand as a proxy. He gave the blood sample. They forged passports. It was a really elaborate ploy. And... He would have got away with it, except the man that stood in as proxy, he then started talking. He said something down the local pub, and a woman overheard, fretted about it. A week later, went to the police saying, you know, I've heard someone saying that they stood in for someone else as a proxy. Anyway, long story short, next thing, I think it was about five in the morning, the police were knocking on this, uh, this chat's door. Um, not the proxy, the other person um, who, who failed to give a blood sample, and he confessed on the spot. And so he was caught. He would have killed again. Mm. So he's now serving two life sentences, tariff of 28 years. He's about, his tariff is nearly up now. So it'd be interesting right. to see what happens there. That was the birth of forensic DNA. That was the very first case in the world. Now, can I give a little plug before I finish? Yes, yes, where yes. I'll go on. Yeah. Right. Can you all, big plug, can you all next Easter Sunday and Easter Monday tune into ITV? because all of this is going to be dramatized in a two-part drama documentary. Anybody heard of John Sim, the actor? Yeah, he's playing me. He's <laughs> 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 David Threlfall. 
Yeah, okay, he's playing Chief Superintendent David Baker. Anna Maidley? Yeah, good, she's playing my wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know who's playing our two daughters, but it's going to be, I, I think the science in it is going to be even worse than CSI. It's <laughs> garbage from beginning to end, but it's a real high-end production, so I, for one, am looking forward to it enormously. So you actually get a, a fairly good representation of this first case. It was, and I have to say, what an incredible case to launch DNA on. Yeah. Extraordinary, mm. absolutely extraordinary. So Bernard, when did you first hear about DNA? Was it that case? Or um, how did it come through the police force? It probably was really, because I think that because it's Colin Pitchfork who was the um, chap who involved, and the story went round quite quickly. And if I'm honest, then one of the first challenges for us, by the way, just in terms of arrests, you forgot to mention I had two arrests at Merton. Oh really? Yeah, for tell, tell us about that. Well, no, well, it, <laughs> well, it was on the MCR and someone stole my coat and I was foolish right. enough to come back in it three months later. And then two weeks later, then someone stole my camera from that coat and I arrested him too. So anyway, <laughs> but, uh, so it's, 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 actually the, uh, it's actually the best detection I've had for a long time. But um, anyway, where was I? No, I think, I think one of the big things about this case, apart from the fact it's fascinating, and Alex has just told the story in, in such an incredible way. If I'm honest, I think the police initially thought, well, for goodness sake, we were going to find the money for this. Because it, you know, it, it came as a great treasure in one sense. But I suppose the initial thought was, how do you connect two events together, or how do you disconnect two events? As Alex had described, yeah. it actually gave someone, it gave someone in a defence. Right. Yeah, but of course, it can, it can sort of give evidence to show that they should be prosecuted. But what we could anticipate is that this needed a whole process to manage it. So someone you know, initially, you know, if you were going to take samples from all suspects. Yeah. So if you think in London, we arrest about a quarter of a million people a year. It's a lot of people. Right. Uh, somebody's got to store the suspect database, then how are you going to collect all this stuff from all the scenes that you go to? So in London at the minute, even though crime's dropping, I just want to make this clear, right. but, we have about, uh, <laughs> but we have about 800,000 crimes a year. Right. It's a lot of crime, yeah. a lot of numbers numerically. So you're going to visit many of those scenes. And we send our CSIs, we send people who look for fingerprints, all the rest of it. So it's a quite a big factory process in a way. So what are we going to do with all this stuff that we get? Because now we're not only looking for fingerprints, and some chemical attributes. Now more and more we're looking at uh, digital photography as a, a forensic science because of CCTV and various other things. But this time this was a new science which was a great benefit, but what you could see coming down the line was we had to industrialise the process, we had to find the money for it, we had to train our people in it, and then of course we had to consider how do we present this evidence to lawyers right. and in turn to, to the courts. So I think we sort of thought it's got great opportunities, but as any leader and manager will look at, say, well how the hell are we going to do this? when you've already got tight budgets, you've already not quite sure how you're going to manage all the things. But that was an initial reaction, was just an emotional thing. But what we saw over the next probably three to five years was that, in fact, it was just a great joy. Um, the only thing I think we had to guard against was that we didn't over-rely on it. Mm -hmm. It's not the answer. Mm -hmm. sure. it's, yeah. it's great potential. And what it gives you is a name to talk to. So, you know, once you've got a name, then that's part of the story. But if they can show they were somewhere else, then you've got to think seriously about that. Could there mm -hmm. be any contamination? Uh, is there any legitimate reason why that person was there? How substantial is the, the match? So if you're not careful at the beginning, I think we had a concern that our detectives, query the courts, query lawyers generally, might over-rely on this very powerful piece of evidence. I think from the beginning we were worried about that. Um, because, you know, police officer like everybody else, you see a great, you know, yeah. fingerprints yeah. have been there yeah. for lots of time. But, I mean, yeah. fingerprints have had their moments when yeah. people haven't always believed the accuracy of some of the, uh, the sort of the identification and still at times could be challenged. So I think, you know, when the science was new, I think everybody intuitively knew this was a great breakthrough. Um, and we hadn't anticipated all the things that came later with familial DNA. And some of the developments now that are moving on that I think will yeah. be progressive in the future. Well, before we come on to those, um, when you think about science, you think something's proven scientifically, it's 100% proven. Yeah. But the whole thing about DNA seems to be that well, it's to do with probability, isn't it? Well, yeah, can, can I just come in on, on fingerprints? Because uh, th this is something that... Uh, was looked at in the Home Office, but I don't think it's ever been published. And that is that given the, the, the impact that DNA had on the development of really good scientific practice in forensic science, and make no mistake, the impact has been enormous. Given that impact, if you go back to regular fingerprints, so ordinary thumbprints and so on, would that now pass muster? If someone today came up with the concept of fingerprinting, would they ever make it into court? And the Home Office statisticians' conclusions were no. That 
by how do you, what are your criteria for declaring a match between a thumbprint, possibly distorted and smudgy, mm. a scene of crime, and the dermal ridge pattern on a given suspect? Mm. What are your objective criteria? Because you actually ask the people doing it, yeah. they say, well, ultimately it's by eye. Right. That's subjective, that's not objective. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then, what about the assumptions of the rarity of that pattern? So, now if you look at the person who, the very first person to analyze fingerprints was Charles Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton, who was very, very interested in, in human individuality. And he made the assumption. Yeah, statistician. Yeah, yeah, yeah statistician. Yeah. He made the assumption that each feature on a fingerprint was independent of the next feature right. on the fingerprint. So you can then multiply probabilities together. So if one in 10 people have this feature and one in 10 people have that feature, then it'd be one in 10 times 10, one in 100 will have both. That's the, the assumption of independence. That's never been tested, ever, right. for fingerprints. Right. So, so we have no objective match criteria. We have no statistical basis whatsoever to declaring them truly unique. Fail. Hmm. Whereas we, with DNA, can actually pass both of our tests. We now have objective criteria for calling a match. In the early days, it was as an element of subjectivity there. That was soon removed. Um, and in terms of statistics, there is not only a very good mathematical model for how DNA works in terms of how genes are distributed around a population, but you, given the huge databases that now exist, you can directly test all those assumptions, and they pass all of them with flying colours. Well, well, I think, uh, well, I'll just think yeah. that one of the things I think, is, I think, I think it's exactly right is that one of the things that's helped with that, although I'm not sure it's entirely resolved the problem, is the automation of fingerprints. Yep. So what that's caused people to do in IT, they have to understand the logic and the algorithms behind the fingerprint, because otherwise you can't yeah. make software work. But I, you're entirely right, because what it does is present, present you with all alternates with a high de higher degree of probability to the ones that are most likely. Right. But there still ends up then being an air of subjectivity to say, well, is it right or wrong? But I think it's, it's the mm. same issue at the end of both processes, yeah. which is that it's not conclusive. It's a piece of evidence which you must test and see if there's corroborating. Because, I mean, if somebody proves that they're in Australia, yeah. Yeah. it's never going to work. Mm. Yeah, look. If, they, if it's likely, it's getting likely. But, of course, if you can find corroborating evidence and if the person provides a reasonable explanation, then usually either the charging process or the courts will have to at least accept it because you have to get beyond the standard of reasonable doubt. Yeah, can, can I just pick up on that? Because the, I mean, I've used the word guilt and innocence. Now, I, I, I'm going to scold myself roundly for that. Right. Because innocent and guilt are legal terms. They're not scientific terms. DNA, if you look at the sequence of DNA, it doesn't have guilt and innocence written into it. Okay, what DNA typing does is to seek to establish whether sample A came from person B. And it can do that with remarkable accuracy and incredible, given current technology, incredible sensitivity. Now, let me, in terms of accuracy, I mean, if, what is the chance that, for example, Bernard and my pattern, uh, given current DNA profiling, would match? And the answer, very simply, is about one part in 10 trillion. That's 10 followed by 13, one followed by 13 noughts. I mean, it's a ridiculously small number, okay? So, so the, the specificity is fantastic. <laughs> But the relevance in a given criminal investigation um, can be well argued. And this is one of the, my real frustrations that when DNA evidence goes to court, it is the duty of the defense to come up with simple, trivial, alternative explanations of why this individual's DNA, which is really beyond doubt that it's that person's DNA, happens to be found apparently associated with the crime scene. And aren't there 101 other trivial explanations for why that might be the case, particularly if you use a DNA typing technology which can type, you know, for example, the, the tiniest trace of saliva. I mean, for example, I've just licked my finger. I mean, uh, that's enough for 100 typings using the standard technology. Okay? So, so, for example, let's suppose that I were to find you with a blood spatter on your clothing from a murder victim. Right. right. We've got one so, just <laughs> that, so, so are, you, are you the murderer? Okay, the murder victim has been knifed. So are you the murderer? Right. No, it does not prove that. Does it place you at the scene of the murder? No, it doesn't. So you could easily argue that the murderer fled, had blood in their clothing, brushed past you in the street, there's a secondary transfer. So, so it's, it's so important to put the DNA evidence into some sort of crime scene context, and all too often that isn't done properly by the defence. I think the other thing, just yeah. to pick up on, because I think 
you look at some other research which has to, when you think about DNA, because as you say in that yeah. first case, you had this mass screening. Mm. So what we know is that generally the research shows that in serial rapes, which is what we have here, serial rapist and the murderer, is that generally the first attack, if you can discover it, is going to be relatively near to where the person lives or is comfortable. Right. So therefore that, that mass screening makes sense. Mm. Now in this case, it looks like geographically both attacks were fairly close. Now you've got to imagine that both attacks were the first attacks, you don't know that. Might have given it a try, mm. not reported. There could be many reasons why that's not the case. But that's the only time that really that mass screening makes sense. And you've also got to go to that issue of, can you persuade people to do it? Because you're quite right, you've got this moral imperative. But of course, the fact that people in that village knew who'd done it and who hadn't mm. might have happened. But generally, if that was in a city like London, a fair chance others wouldn't. You so wouldn't, that moral yeah. imperative doesn't always work in that same way. So you've got to imagine that that's going to work and that it's a fair, there's, a, there's a benefit in doing it. Mm -hmm. And there's been quite a few cases where, as, as Alex was saying right at the beginning, it wasn't clear that the identity of the person who provided the sample in the mass screening had been established beyond all reasonable doubt or even, you know, to, you know, it was the person who said they'd given it. And that's caused some real challenges in some of the historic cases where we, people were convinced they sampled an area where the offender may have lived. But of course, unless you're absolutely sure, as it's the invest very first case, you've got too much confidence, the person doesn't live in that area, when in fact you tested the wrong person, or at least one of them. You did a mass screening in Liverpool, mm. didn't you? How, how did that work? Well, it was really on the back of, we'd, we had a, a, we have a college at Brams Hill, and I went on a course which was about series and serial attackers, and uh, we, we went through various aspects of that, you know, that, those investigations, and one of them was talking about this very, this first series, the, the broadly for the police, an immature process of investigation, where we learned lessons along the way. Right. And one of the lessons was this point about did all the people who were tested in the first batch of DNA mass screening, were they really the people you thought you tested? And at the same time at the college, there was one of our detective superintendents, and in the bar I was talking to about it, he said, well, actually, he said, we had a case. This is why bars are important for police. Yeah. <laughs> it is, that's where we found most of our stuff. But he said, you know, he said, we had a case in, he said, I think there'd been six attacks. There'd been two in St. Helens, one over in Lancashire, uh, a couple down in Cheshire. There was the link between them, I think three of the six attacks, there were rapes or serious, very serious indecent assaults. Three had got unidentified DNA and they'd done some mass screening. And with that in mind, I then went back to force. I met uh, the, the chap who was the SAO, the senior investigating officer, who by then was in charge of CID. Now he was generous enough to say, when I sort of shared what I've just shared with you, his first reaction was, so if I'm absolutely honest, I'm not sure we could put our hand on our heart and say we'd done it properly for the, the very reasons that we said. And I said, well, how many people did we sample? And this was around the first attack. Mm. And I, said, I think it was 3,000. And we talked about it, and we said, well, what do we do? And I said, well, we'll do it again. So we put a team together of six people, and over the following, I think it took them 18 months, then they did it. Now, bearing in mind, this is about six years after the first sampling. Right. So bearing in mind what's happened, people mm -hmm. have disappeared off, they've changed their life, they've died. Um, but at, at the end of that 18-month period, think we couldn't find six. Hmm. So it was a remarkable effort by this <laughs> small team. Yes. And by then, they absolutely guaranteed the people who said they'd provide the sample had. And we didn't find them. And did people have to provide the sample? No, it was the same thing. You know, there's no legal it's requirement. It's an amazing take-up, isn't it? Yeah. But you know, when you say to somebody, we're investigating murder, right. uh, or a serious attack on a child, or whatever it happens to be, you know, I, and the other thing, frankly, I suppose the attacker will know that if they say no and they're the only one, we will be interested. You know, I mean, if, you know, you, if there is no chance there could be the attacker, then of course you'll discount that. But you would be interested where they were at the time. You would be interested, was it physically possible? Uh, you will start to, I mean, have you got a previous criminal record? You know, there are a series of things you would go through. And if you say, oh, look, this is just someone who's got a moral feeling that this is wrong, a conscience thing for whatever reason, or just the exercise of their rights, you've got to respect that. But you would be interested and you would inquire. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we knew that. As it happened, within a further, I think, six months of ending the second mass screening, they were found in another part of the country when they were arrested for another offence and the DNA hit. Um, but it just shows that it's an it's a excellent thing. But you've got to think it through. And it's, and it's very labour intensive. That mass screening is, and, and it costs. And I'm not, you know, it's, people, that, my point is not that you know, money matters in terms of solving a murder, but it does. Because you've got many things to do at the end of the day. I mean, we spend in the Met about £5 million a year on DNA. That's not the people who administer it, that's just the sampling. Mm -hmm. so, so we have to pay someone to do this stuff and then send it back to us. If we want it quicker, we pay more, probably about six times more. If we want it within 24, 48 hours, which often we do for very serious things, or you've got to 
you know, you've got a suspect in custody, you don't want to let go before you get that result. We want it now, so they charge a premium. Mm. So the money at the end of the day will, will, will make a difference. Um, and over the years, I mean, some mm. other countries in the same position we were when we first started, we wouldn't take samples from every suspect we arrested. So that quarter of a million in London, you would take it from murderers, rapists, very serious crime. Now we now take it from everyone, because what we know is that some people sadly migrate from burglary to, to murder. So it's really important to have a, you know, the biggest sample we can achieve. Um, and that's the way it develops eventually. Now, over time, that's been restricted by law that that, that database has, has changed for those who are not subsequently convicted, which is fine, and that's what democracies do. As a police officer, I always want as much as I can get hold of. I don't, <laughs> you know, I just, if there's any chance of catching a rapist, why would I care? Yeah. But I, I say no, that's not really the, the case. But I think you, know, you do need challenge for someone to say, well, do you really need this? Does it ever prove eventually that someone committed a rape? I suppose I only want, I always want that one chance in 25 years, but it's probably very, it's not highly probable. Yeah. But c c coming, coming back to the, the, these mass screens, I mean, you don't need a mass screen, you've got a database. Mm. There's every chance that you, you will take your victim, get you know, a relevant crime scene DNA from that person, put it over the database, get a hit, prime suspect, job done with a bit of uh, further investigation. And that would have worked in this Envy murder case, very first murder mm. case. This, Colin Pitchfork had a prior had record. previous, did he? Yeah, he had a previous. <laughs> so had there been a DNA database, right, he would have been on that database. The first victim recovered semen, they would have got a hit, he would have been inside, and it would have saved the life of the second victim. So a, a mass screens, I mean, for example, let's suppose there's a murder in the middle of London. You can't do a mass screen there. The, 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 the population pool is just gigantic. It's uh, multi, multinational. I mean, you never do it. There'd be no uptake at all. So I think the, I mean, clearly the way forward is, is, is database and appropriate use of that. And Bern has already touched on this. So is this a good time to start thinking? Well, I was wondering, I mean, should, let me ask yeah. a question. Should we all be forced to give our yeah. DNA to the government? I mean, in Iceland, they do that, for example. There is, there is DNA of the whole population is owned by a company called Decode. Uh, and I was suddenly saying, oh, well, what's going on here? No, it's, well, it's, <laughs> no, 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 should we be giving out our DNA right, every time you apply for a passport? Right, should no, you no, give no, your DNA yeah, to no, no, Let me just set the record straight on poor old Iceland. The first, the whole population is not database. Ah. Uh, you have Optail. And that databasing is purely for, for medical genetic research. Ah. Okay, so the idea is you take all these Icelandic people and Icelandic people, I mean, they suffer all the sort of common diseases that we do. So you're looking for genes for diabetes, for osteoporosis, and so on. But you then combine that with a huge amount of DNA information and with the really great thing that Icelandic have, fantastic genealogy. Any self-respecting Icelandic person can take their genealogy back very easily for about 800 years. The, the, the parish records there are fantastic. Put it all together in a great big computer, and you get genes for disease and they're not allowed to use that under any circumstance, as far as I know, for any criminal investigation, no matter how serious. Actually, they send their DNA analysis to Sweden, apparently. Precisely, yeah. It takes forever right. to get so, back. So, <laughs> that, that's, can, can I just put this yeah. huge Berlin wall between medical genetics and what you can do with Fair DNA, enough, which yeah. is fantastic, Absolutely. and forensic DNA. And there the twain shall meet, in my view. I mean, there are some people that argue that Look, this give me give you, for example, uh, National Health Service now has a plan to sequence the entire genomes of 100,000 UK citizens and then do long-term follow-up medical studies trying to track down all sorts of interesting uh, genes involved in disease. And there are people who would argue as well, actually, that's quite a good police resource as well. Why can't the police tap into all of that? And I make a strong argument, no, that people are volunteering for... Uh, this very, potentially very intrusive medical investigations, uh, that is well outside the bailiwick of the police. So the police certainly have their own database, but the two should not cross-talk. But, but you ask, should we all go onto a database? Well, that would get round, that, that's not a new suggestion, by the way. The first time that was ever suggested was in the late 1980s, by the uh, Women's Institute, the National Council of <laughs> Women's Institute, who, who put up a, a, a resolution at their annual conference for the mandatory databasing of all men. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Which I felt slightly uncomfortable. I mean, there are one or two criminal women as well. So, um, so, so it's not a new idea, but I don't think that would ever happen in Britain. I mean, the, 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 
the, the potential civil rights implications are, are pretty tough. But you can ask the question, is it happening anywhere in the world? And the answer is yes. So, for example, Portugal passed legislation for database in the adult population. That was then repealed. Kuwait has done the same. Uh, United Arab Emirates has done it, and they're doing it. So UAE, uh, their plans are to database the entire population of 10 million. So not only the Emirati, but also the, the, the millions of workers, including an awful lot of Brits, that happen to be working over there. So um, Now, I was over recently in Dubai, and I was pumping them like mad for just how far they'd gone down this, uh, what I regard as a fascinating experiment sort of social engineering experiment. And it's difficult to get an answer out of them because, of course, this is um, basically a decision made by the Council of Sheikhs. And if you ask the ordinary forensic scientists, I mean, they obviously you know, are in a delicate position um, in terms of potentially querying it. But I get the sense that it is moving rather slowly. And the target is obviously all the convicted criminals over there and the military as well. Remember. Uh, databasing military makes a huge amount of sense. DNA is your molecular dog tag if you get blown to bits mm. on a field of battle. And there are a number of, uh, of armies around the world where, where the entire personnel have been databased. So that's quite common. So watch the United Arab Emirates. <laughs> so why are they doing it? Fight against crime? Well, maybe. Um, mass disaster analysis, identification. You know, there's a, a major natural disaster. Maybe state surveillance or oh, perish the thought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder. So I mean, I'm watching that with great interest, but I get the sense of just moving very, very slowly. I think it's a damn good idea. No, I don't. <laughs> I, 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 um, I mean, what's quite well, interesting is when you talk to, um, you know, you think about police officers, for example, yeah. the sample group. So we, when I joined, and still happens that you know all our fingerprints take. Right. The reason the fingerprints taken obviously is to exclude you from the scene of a crime. So if you're know, an innocent leaving a fingerprint by a CSI or a police officer, you need that, that, that evidence. When DNA came in, then for the same reasons, we needed to capture the DNA of police officers. So it was a voluntary thing, but not every police officer wanted to do it. Mm. But that, that gives, but, but then, that give you the, the, your ultimate alibi, that, that you're on an exclusion database. So if I find your DNA... I think they were more worried, it. Alex, I think they more worried about paternity suites. I think that was the... Well, no, no. <laughs> the, uh, no, 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 quite so. No, you, 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 you commit a murder. We then find your DNA at the scene of crime, but you're on an exclusion database because you're in the police. They probably don't want to commit murders. That's the only thing. No, but I'm just saying that there's a, <laughs> there's a disparity here. Yeah, but, but I think the, the broad I mean, point is that they were volunteers and they decided not to volunteer. Right. Yeah. Um, now, it's now not voluntary. It's now mandatory. Mm -hmm. So they, they have it taken. So I'm just observing that for the police uh, group, who you might think have a more draconian, so we, everybody should have it, when it came to themselves, they didn't want it. Yeah. Which is not a bad piece of evidence. In fact, probably society, well, one doesn't want it and doesn't need it. I think it's a, I mean, I think morally it's probably just not a good idea. And I think unless people really want to do it, I don't think it's probably even worth considering. Logistically, it's probably not that good an idea either. either. But you end up with so many, if you're not careful, so many responses, how much further forward are you? So I don't think it's a, uh, I it's a good idea. And if I'm honest, I'm not sure people trust the state enough. No. Um, and I'm not sure they either trust scientific development enough either. So what we don't know yet is what that will tell us in the future. So it looks like, you know, for a, you know, as we said earlier, there are developments already. Familial, we can, mm -hmm. one of the things that's investigatively quite interesting is even if you haven't got a sample of the database, you might be able to establish it's part of the family. Mm -hmm. Now that can be vitally important. If you've got a very serious crime, you've got nowhere to go. So if you manage to find out that a burglar, apparently might be the brother, cousin or whatever, it's somewhere to start in that inquiry if you've got nowhere else to start. You don't do it very often. It's very expensive and it's not, it can produce too many positives. So that's quite helpful. But as we get you know, more DNA things come forward, you know, what you can predict from DNA, you know, like height, race, it looks like they're even beginning to think about facial characteristics. Mm -hmm. And who can say what that might tell you? I mean, already insurers might be interested in what's your likelihood of death by a certain cause mm -hmm. in a certain period of time. Well, that's going to make a real impact. So I think for lots of reasons, it's probably not very wise. And if I'm honest, I'm not sure I trust the state sometimes. Right. Um, and if you say it's not only this state, what about other states? You know, without getting into about European discussions, but you know, it might not just be our legislature. What about if you had a broader legislature was thinking about how this might develop? What about extradition treaties with America? Is that okay to have a, how do they treat it? So I think, I think for lots of reasons, I don't think I would do it. Um, I say intuitively, you might say, yeah, of course, it'd be mm -hmm. great to just solve all crime. But it doesn't solve all crime. 
and it's a relatively small percentage of the coin that we sold with it, probably around 10% or less, really helpful. And often it, it's combined with an investigation. So you've already got an image of somebody who's committed a crime, that's a really good start. If you've got a witness who said he did it, because they know them, that's another good start. You don't always need the DNA. DNA is in a relatively small group of offences where it's the only thing you have to go on, which it makes it incredibly powerful. Often it's just in addition to other things you have. I was going to ask about that and how DNA fits into the rest of the forensic picture because the murder clear-up rate in London is how much? About 94%. Which is incredibly high and very depressing yeah. for a detective writer if you, if you get it that right so often. <laughs> you only write about a very small group. <laughs> Precisely, though, yeah. yes. Um, and DNA, you said, uh, is responsible for... Well, obviously, must help in a lot of those investigations, but what has changed in the last few years in forensics that helps you solve crimes now that you couldn't do 10 years ago, say, or 20 the, years ago? The biggest change for, for London, certainly, uh, UK generally, is CCTV. Mm -hmm. So that it's very hard to move around London without being spotted by it. So, you know, you can think of... I mean, you've got public space. Uh, I don't know about here, but I suspect, you know, somewhere around here there'll be some, something where the recorders all coming in. Uh, taxis have it. All buses in London have it. The tube has it. So you're very hard to move around. It may not capture you committing the crime, but it will often capture you arriving at the scene. You know, the victim and the offender have got to arrive at the scene at some stage mm -hmm. and have got to have had a route. So somewhere along that path, you will have left a trace. And I think really what CCTV and facial imagery are becoming is a fourth technical third for forensic science mm -hmm. uh, in a way that we are now having to start to invest in a different way. So we had to invest in s DNA when it came mm -hmm. along, uh, and it's a really profound change and they're the public systems you think of how many people in this audience will have taken an image today of somebody they know or the place they were at so often we've got images coming back from phones ipads lots of things the challenge for us at the moment is not to collect the images the biggest challenge is to uh, link the scene of the crime the face of the offender to the database of images from the people we arrest so we do three things for everybody we arrest take the fingerprints take the dna we take the photograph over the last you know, 10 years, that's become digital photography, mm -hmm. which allows a possibility that you can use a facial recognition software to link the scene of the crime to, to the offender. Mm -hmm. The biggest challenge we've got at the moment is a big strategic shift that's going to have to happen. All the cameras are looking down. <laughs> so, you know, if you think over the last 10, 15, 20 years, then all the cameras installed have generally been high looking down to capture the scene. All the capture at the top of your head. <laughs> and the facial recognition Bold software spot needs recognition. this. <laughs> <laughs> if we had that, we'd be well aware. Um, but what you need is this. Right. So often we've got images of people from here, and the hit rate on the software is low. So frankly, we're in the process of trying to shift the cameras down or get another one installed. Um, so it's, it's a, that, but that's a fantastic opportunity. So I think that'll be another big step forward. But it's one of the big things that contributes to that detection rate. Uh, despite the fact, as you said, in London, we've got a hugely mobile population. And most, and there's only way, three ways to detect crime. So you either catch them doing it, someone tells you who did it, or forensically you link them. Yeah. They're the three, I don't think there are any other ways. Mm. So you've got to maximize those. And the big challenge we have in London is a mobile society. One doesn't always spot patterns of somebody, well, you know, that looks like a burglar to me. They don't live here. There's an unusual pattern of behavior. Um, the, of the people we arrest at the moment, 28% are foreign national offenders. Now, it doesn't mean to say that foreigners are responsible for crime. That's broadly the representation within, within London. Real challenge when we want to find a, a scene of a burglary, the DNA of a Estonian burglar, because their DNA will be on the Estonian database, mm -hmm. or Nigeria, or wherever, American. Um, so we're comparing our scenes against the UK database, when, of course, the populations are moving at such a speed that that is not always very productive. In fact, often... Other countries are better off checking our database <laughs> for their criminals than they are checking their own. We've got the largest well, one in the world, have we? Uh, no, I don't no, know. No, not at all. The, the, okay, the, a few quick numbers on, on national DNA database. Every major country, with the exception, I think, of Italy, has got a, a national DNA database. Every country in the world <laughs> has, uh, uses, deploys DNA. Uh, quite often, a small country would simply outsource it. Uh, the biggest DNA database is likely to be in China. Hard to get numbers. I've seen numbers as high as 20 million mm. as the size of their database. UK database currently stands at 6 million thereabouts. United States about 14 million. Uh, total number of offenders database worldwide is now probably above 50 million people. That's about 1% of the world population. In terms of database sharing, uh, 
the European Union passed uh, a treaty called the Treaty of Prum a number of years ago, which allows for the free exchange of DNA profile information, <coughs> not individual information, but profile information between all EU countries. Uh, Britain, for some crazy reason, elected to opt out of that on civil rights grounds, and I'll, I'll happily come back to that if you like. So we are not in a position to be able to share our database with the rest of Europe. The rest of Europe is doing exactly that. Now, I've recently looked at the, it was a summary of information done when the Netherlands and Belgium put their databases together, and they got thousands of hits, considerable number of very serious crimes, entirely new leads. And most fascinatingly, there were convicted criminals on that database that popped up on both databases, quite under, mm. unlikely under mm. different names. So you've got people under dual identities, I mean, all sorts of mm. shenanigans, some of them flushed out of the woodwork uh, by uh, exchanging database information. Now, the civil rights concerns are, are, can be mitigated very easily but by simply, and this is what's done in practice, is the inquiry is, for example, there's a crime in the middle of London, you can't find anybody on the <coughs> database, so you then send that DNA profile off to Interpol or whatever, that is then taken around Europe, and then if there's a match, then it'd be up to the, the country with the match, then to go through some due legal process to unmask the name of that individual, which they may choose not to do if they so wish. Um, so that the, the exchange is not of individual data, it's purely of the DNA profile itself. I don't see the problem in that. Mm. Sure. So I would actually argue it's criminally irresponsible of the Home Office not to permit that sharing of information, mm. particularly in the middle of London, where, where you know a significant proportion of crime will be by non UK citizens. Yeah. Well, I'm really glad that Alex said yeah. that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, no, I'll say again, yeah, criminally <laughs> irresponsible. Um, yeah. But the prune thing is a good idea. Uh, yeah. In fact, interestingly, I went to uh, I went out to Romania about 18 months ago uh, to to develop our relationship because of some issues we we're having at the time. Well, they've got a good DNA database, mm -hmm. same as ours, good fingerprint yeah. system. Yeah. Uh, and interestingly, they've got a tube, as I would describe it, from their database to the German, the Austrian, and I think two other countries. But we haven't got that tube. And uh, yes, okay, it's a bit like when DNA first started. We can send an email, we can uh, you know, we'll plod around the world and see if anybody's got it. Or would it not be a bad idea for a computer to just do that? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, I, But this is only on a criminal database. Mm -hmm. That's not on a you know, general database. So I think for us, we, uh, we would like to see that. But as we saw last night, you know, it's not only about the issue, it's also about European politics. And uh, that's, mm. you know, that's quite a tense and uh, volatile area. So I think we stay out of the politics, but we just say pragmatically, we really would like this to work mm. efficiently. When you describe a modern murder investigation, it seems to be vast amounts of information. I mean, megabytes, terabytes, gigabytes, and it's to do with processing and an analyzing it. Is there still a role for the sort of good old detective yeah. solving the mm. case? How, how does that work, or is that just history. No, but it's still, it's still the major reason why police officers become police officers. I think, you know, I think um, whether it be journalists or police officers, I think we're always intrigued by people's motives. Mm -hmm. So you want to talk to people, you want to find out a bit about them, you know, what makes them tick. And it's amazing what they tell you. Now, you might imagine the murderer will never tell you that they did it, but mm -hmm. sometimes they do. Uh, and sometimes they leak. So, and that's true of witnesses too. I think, you know, we see it in courts where people will say one thing and then it's proved that in fact that can't possibly be true. So I think that's what fascinates police officers. And generally, say, going back to the one of the tests of how you detect crime, people know who did it. Mm -hmm. Not every time, but the vast majority of the time. Somebody knows something of the chain of events that led to that event. So whether it's the motive, whether it's how they arrived at the scene, somebody you talked to them afterwards, you know, there's always something there where people will leave a trail. And the way that you get into that trail is to talk to people. So I think good detectives listen long and speak little ah. on the whole and, uh, and are intrigued by people's behavior. And often what you see after crime is a change in behavior. We're looking at it in the terrorist world at the minute in terms of how people's behavior changes before they leave the country, where they might go to Syria or mm -hmm. Iraq. But it often changes after uh, a crime. And it's not the fact whether somebody becomes more volatile, drinks more, drinks a lot. It's the fact they drink more. It's the mm -hmm. fact that they become more subdued mm -hmm. when they're being extrovert. It's, it's the change in behavior I think fascinate police officers. I'm and not so sure. gut instinct is still well, important. I, I think sometimes you describe it's almost vital because well, reading so. people is what it's all about. Yeah, all I think you know, there's no so. doubt that you know, it's become more scientific in many ways. Yeah. But we, uh, in Merseyside again, we, uh, we had a really good, uh, for me, the best I say we used to work with. And one of this chap called Peter Curry, who did some fantastic work around the, lots of murders and the older Hay um, child 
um, samples that were held in the hospital. Um, and we had one terrible murder, which I, I won't go into the details of, except that Peter was away. Um, and we spoke on the phone, and I was trying to make sure he didn't come back from holiday, although I really wanted him to, because uh, I, I trusted him. Mm. I knew that we were going to have problems with this mm. thing, and I thought he would be the best person. But it wasn't fair to, to disturb his holiday. But remember when he came back, and this, this murder took an awful long time to, uh, to solve, but we knew from the beginning who did it. And the point he made was, was exactly right, which is sometimes we reach for the technology too early when we could have talked to people a bit longer. Yeah. Um, and sometimes, because it's available, not, I don't think so much DNA actually, but certainly in terms of technology, what's on their phone, who were they on talking to on the internet, there's a danger. You say, right, let's go for that. Uh -huh. When in fact you talk to them and say, well, no, it's around the corner. You know, there's that mm -hmm. piece of evidence. So he, he, I thought that was a very profound point for us as police officers. But it's certainly true that we're accumulating more and more data. So, you know, the, uh, we, we, we've got a bottleneck at the moment in terms of our terrorist investigations and the serious crime. Because if you arrest somebody for this type of offence, you will seize everything they've got. You know, people have got a lot. Mm. All the know, computer data and mobile phone yeah, data. Yeah, if you ask speak. people in this audience, I don't know, two phones, three iPads, mm. you know, mm. et al. Mm. So you've just got this, first of all, lots of material. Now you've got to discriminate between the volume of what you want. And that is not always straightforward. So, well, surely you're looking for what happened on Tuesday. Well, sometimes you're not. You want to know what they did in March when they met the person who mm. arranged the murder. Mm. So that, what you now got is a lot of stuff. Now, some clever software has, over time has helped us to, you know, discriminate. Mm. So, you know, when you're talking about things like child obscene images, I mean, if you imagine the sort of job that some people have in our service, yeah. which is to look at this stuff yeah. to prove that that is an obscene image and it's in grade the highest grade. Mm. Well, that's not a very pleasant job. Yeah. So there's some software now that says, right, I've seen that before. It's category two. Mm. You don't need to look at it. Mm. Uh, still, you've got, a, still got an issue. So that's one example where software over time and clever IT has helped us uh, develop. But the more able IT gets, the more of a bottleneck we're creating. Um, and the only other thing I'd add, I mean, we just created a cyber unit of 500 detectives, including police staff and, and officers, because it's an area of general crime investigation we are not fully equipped to do. We're equipped on the burglar side, the grievous bodily harm side, the kidnap. But this is an area that we're really having to invest a lot in, in, an e in a way that I don't think we've quite anticipated. We know we want a vehicle. We're not sure whether it's a half track or a, a bicycle yet. Mm -hmm. um, but we're going to have to learn these lessons quickly. It's in danger at some stage of overwhelming us. So mm. I suspect we're still going to have to veer back to the human behaviour side. Mm. But it's a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. A question for both of you. It, how good is Britain at forensics? Is it getting worse? Is it getting better? How can we improve? Do you, do you have right? a theory? Oh, no, Alice has got a view, so I'm going to follow on. <laughs> right. Um, ten years ago, we were world leading. And that was in part thanks to the, the Forensic Science Service, which back in those days was um, basically part of the Home Office, the ring fence budget. The Home Office took their direct responsibility for developing and fostering forensic science in the UK. And they played a tremendously important role in the development, mass implementation of, of DNA typing. Uh, that was uh, the, the FSS disappeared, what, two or three years ago. Um, we're basically now at back level of the Banana Republic. Uh, there, is, there is no public provision of forensic science in the UK. It's solely within the private sector, apart from one or two, a few handful of forensic laboratories around and forensic departments within university who are struggling desperately to get any funding whatsoever. The standard route for funding is through the Research Council, the Medical Research Council, DVSRC, and so on. And it's very difficult for forensic research groups to come up with persuasive research proposals that will compete against the really stellar fundamental science uh, that, that these organizations are funding. So it's withering on the vine. <coughs> Terrible. Do you think anything could be done in the academic world to help? Yeah, I come to the same place from a slightly different, you know, slightly different yeah. start. So certainly I've got a belief that, you know, police in general is, is not well served by our universities. So, um, you know, we have faculties of engineering, yeah. we have yeah. faculties of medicine, we don't have any faculties of policing. And yet a quarter of a million people in this country try to keep 60 million people safe. On the back of, you know, I come along and say, well, I think, you know, we should lock lots of people up. Uh, we should have repeat offender, repeat location. Mm -hmm. We've got a bit of research there, but I don't think it's good enough. So you know, we pick a bit from forensic science. We pick a little from criminology, a bit a bit from sociology. Um, but I think it's a shame that we haven't got that rigor of academic mm -hmm. thought. Yeah. I'm not arguing that all police officers should be academics. That's really not what I'm arguing. 
but I think our universities should trust, well, should think it's a priority enough to think that this is important enough to invest in by teaching, by research development, by finding out what they're doing in Finland and whether Namibians are doing it better. Yes. Taking that research and then helping us to develop our training, our leadership, our structure, our IT. So for me, that's, that's a slightly bigger foundation, but the, the, the fundamental point about forensic science is that for me, I think, I think exactly, Alex is exactly right, is that, you know, you probably know better, but probably about 10, probably slightly longer ago, the Forensic Science Service, which was a public service, mm -hmm. uh, they created a market. So what it said is, right, forensic science, you cannot be a monopoly provider, um, so there would be competition, and they ended up with four or five producers of, oh, sorry, um, suppliers of various parts of the, uh, the market, and 43 police forces in Scotland and other eight in Northern Ireland mm -hmm. competed in this market. Um, not very well organized. FSS, in my view, and it may be somebody in the audience is from FSS, so I take care, but I'll, I'll stick by my view, which I think it became a bit like a public service that got privatized and still kept its public service culture, sadly. Mm. Um, it was competing with giants who knew how to make money. It didn't know how to save costs. So it, uh, it struggled in the same way, sadly, I think BT, anybody from BT? <laughs> I'll not to share all my grief, but I mean, the BT, BA, I think have struggled at times. I think they've got some old yeah. public service culture in a competitive environment, and they ended up being subsidized for year after year by the public purse when they were competing in a, in a market. So their, their demise, in one sense, was predictable. Um, and some of the providers, to be fair, who were the LGCs of this world and a few others, actually were very, not so much competitive, but were very good at taking specialist areas and producing some incredible results. So they went back to some old cases, spotted some really things that FSS, Forensic Science, should have spotted in the past, and made them as a core celebra, and then used that as their marketing sort of projection. So um, I think Alex is right that one, the market is very confused at the minute. We in the Met have taken over the FSS provision. Mm. Um, but we haven't got a medium term strategy. Our strategy was to stop the thing folding. So we've now got, as part of Lambda, yes. a huge thing. In fact, you might have yeah, seen yeah. uh, recently, we're invested hugely in it. In fact, the major problem we've got at the moment is stop the rebuilding work contaminating the forensic science. Mm. But, um, you know, but we, you know, what's the middle, what's the strategy for this? It's, this is just compromise, just, you know, filling the financial gap. But where Sticking should we go? Sticking clusters, as they say. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, you've got the integrity of the process to think mm. about. We've now got mm. forensic science regulators who come and check us regularly, more regularly now that we're, we've got some building work going on. So there's a system. But I don't think there's a strategy yet, and I think it's in a bit of a mess. And finally, the point that Alex makes is that I don't think there's a strategy to invest. You know, how do you invest in the five, next five, ten years, apart from just what drives money? Mm. That's not a good strategy all the time. How do you make the best of new science? Where do you spot the gaps in the police investigative process? This, you know, where are new ideas coming from? So for me, it's a bit narrow and small, and for all the reasons Alex said, I agree. Mm. I mean, can, can I just sort of stem from that, sort of taking a more academic view of, of things? Uh, I don't want to paint a totally bleak picture. Just ask how many university undergraduate courses are there with the name forensic in the title and I, I did a count about a couple of years ago there's about 440 mm. around the UK so these are enormously popular courses if you talk to almost any young kid what do they want to be seen a crime officer we've seen CSI we, we, this is mm. what we've got to do yeah. so so there's a huge yearning for young people to get into the field and the universities of course respond to that by coming up with all these courses, many of which are now regulated quite well, so they are properly accredited. Uh, whether these are the most appropriate courses for a young person which is going to forensic science is another, another issue. I mean, I'd actually argue that, you know, any young person who wants to become a forensic scientist, do the basic science. Become a chemist, become a physicist, become an IT expert, uh, and then, uh, in training, in-house training, then acquire the forensic skills that you layer on top of that. Um, but, it, but it is a big problem. So we are producing vast number of kids uh, with degrees in forensic, this, that, and the other. Um, and are they then the employed by forensics? Well, no. I mean, if you, if you work out the numbers, I, 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 would, I would hazard a guess you probably, to maintain steady state in the UK, you probably need to train up maybe about a couple of hundred forensic scientists a year, most of those taken from the basic sciences. Mm -hmm. So uh, the numbers don't square. Yeah, yeah they really don't square. So, it, I mean, it, it is a problem. The, the, there's other problems as well. I mean, what I would, I'll tell you what I would love, and that is a National Institute of Forensic Science that has a degree of ring-fence budget where the research on, on forensic science and innovation and 
getting a you know, really good fa automated facial recognition system can be done with that. Any worries about is there a profit in this? Um, you know, can we turn this you know, into a decent business model? All of those considerations go out the window. You pursue it as scientists. And you interface that <coughs> with academic research in the universities, something this country has never, ever been good at, even in the best days of the forensic science. Because remember, the next big transformative thing to forensic science is unpredictable, and it is not going to come from the forensic community. Mm. Forensic science... And this sounds awful, but I'm not being rude here. And I think any forensic scientist would agree. It's ultimately parasitic. It will take whatever it can from any branch of science. If it's of use in the forensic arena, they will take it in and adapt it. So what we're seeing now in the UK is what a lot of the forensic research going on is within the private sector. There are also service providers. And if you go from that, that long spectrum, from fundamental discovery right the way through to you know, crime scene application, that private companies are operating right down at that end. They're tweaking the technology to make it better for crime scene. They're not, nor should they be, I would argue, feeding in right at the fundamental end, creating these sort of new revolutions that are, could be coming around the corner. So let's have a National Institute of Forensic Science, properly recognized. We're almost out of time for me asking questions. Um, I think, yep. But I've got one more which I definitely do want to ask. Yeah. You haven't seen CSI, yeah. but do you read crime novels? Do you watch forensic TV? And if you yeah. do, yeah. do you like it? Do you hate it? What, what, oh, what, oh, I love, what winds I love you it. Up? I love it. I had actually, uh, I got a load of grief from one or two authors that I won't mention right at the beginning. It's like, oh, Jeffries has spoiled all our plots. And I did a, a, a stand-up <laughs> double act at yeah, Rich University with, with P.D. James, no less. Right. And she said, no... Alec has not wrecked the novel in terms of plots. He's actually given us a thousand new plots, all based on DNA. That's true. Now, That's I haven't true. read enough. The, the few that I've bumped into in my, my novel reading, you know, is the DNA portrayed well? Actually, yes, pretty accurate. Pretty accurate. But often it's just sort of, it was his mind, oh, we did a DNA and it was so and so. Yeah. So it's become so much part of the popular culture, you don't even have to worry about how it works what it is, and where the technology might be going in the future. And there's a lot of fun things there, too. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Bernard? Do you, see, do you ever watch police on television, um, fictional well, police on television? Well, do you read crime fiction? Yeah, certainly read crime fiction, yeah. I enjoy it. I mean, Michael Ridpath is very good. Right? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's 20 quid for the warden and 20 quid for Bernard. <laughs> the, uh, the Fire and Ice series, I don't know if anybody knows about that. But, uh, no, it's very, uh, I, I do enjoy it. So, no, I'd, I'd read lots of uh, crime stuff. And yet, I suppose, like with everybody else in an area that you know, you, you suspend judgment for a bit. You, for a while, you used to get irritated with things, and then you realize, well, just take it. <laughs> yeah. If you look at most, you know, the fact that he now puts some plastic shoes on, but then goes and touches the body, I mean, yeah, he's yeah. neither here nor there. But, um, so I think, uh, you know, I think that you just have to enjoy it. It's a bit like, it's a bit like Downton Abbey. I mean, it means nothing, but I quite enjoy it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I, no, I think uh, most of the, the different police programs um, seem to work quite well. I mean, there's a new one starting, which has had a pre, um, bit of a, a start, which is called Babylon. I don't know if anybody saw the first programme, which is based around it's the Met. pilot. It's very yeah. funny. Yeah. yeah, I didn't think it was funny. <laughs> no, I didn't. I was, I was only joking. I, I, we turned off after about 15 <laughs> minutes. I couldn't make, it didn't make me laugh enough. Um, but it's, it's going to be a programme that we'll, uh, we'll see what they do about the Met. But, you know, I, I, I just think that uh, it's there to be enjoyed. And crime is fa ultimately fascinating, isn't it? But it's the motivation. I mean, a good crime novel is all about motivation. Yeah. I was intrigued to hear you saying that earlier, that a yeah. good policeman yeah. reads people and they're good... A novelist I mean, the only thing about them. novels is often you find is how many people die in the space of 200 pages. It's just amazing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. I mean, if, we, if that had happened to us, we would be criticised to every Home Affairs Select Committee uh, <laughs> that I've ever been to. Uh, you know, you'll have, what, five people to die in two weeks? And you knew who did it? Um, so I suppose that's always a little intriguing. But, of course, that's, that's the great joy of fiction. It's, um, it's fascinating. I, I always enjoy the plots because you, you know, the, the mind work those plots out. But the always try the worrying thing is what the authors do in their spare time. Mm. <laughs> Let's change the subject. <laughs> well, but you know, what's going through a person's mind that comes with some of these plots is deeply worrying. I mean, I've met P.D. James, actually. Um, P.D. James came in uh, to the yard about a year ago, and I met her at a dinner. Uh, she was fascinating. She's now 90-something. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great age, and still incredibly sharp. And she went and saw our... Uh, we'd, we'd arranged for her to, to go and see yeah. some of our murder detectives. 
because she was think she's she's still got a plot that she's thinking about writing. And so I said, well, you know, would you be interested, as Michael might be, in just meeting some of the people who are doing it day by day? And she went and saw them, and she just charmed them. They, uh, we, they, 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 she, she wouldn't leave. Yeah. She was just a, an incredible uh, person. Uh, and still, you know, this, this bright brain. I think, didn't she start as a forensic scientist? She worked, started in, she worked in the home office. Uh, I've got a feeling she had some science background. Anyway, great, great mind. So, um, questions? Any questions from anyone? Yes, one there. Luckily, worked for the television network that put CSI on the air. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I should say, if you'd been more enthusiastic, you should have shouldn't have patented CSI. You should have had a piece of the show because there are five spin-off shows in that. <laughs> and I, I think at one there were 13 crime shows and the seven days of prime time on just one network. So clearly, there's a marketing opportunity for you in, in CSI that somehow we ought to be able to orchestrate, because um, because the perception of all these shows is that everybody's incredibly smart. The detectives are always very smart, the police are always very mm -hmm. smart, and, and I don't know how you could ever get that many people to do that, solve that many crimes working in Scotland Yard or anywhere else, but, but there is there is some resource here that might could be used to solve your problems with who's doing what to whom, <laughs> because the fascination is endless. I mean, every year we used to meet and go through pilots for the television season, and we get 20 to 30 crime shows offered to us, because in the end, when everybody else fails, crime mm -hmm. shows succeed, and succeed, and succeed. So th there's something there uh, to, to, as, a, uh, as a tool for generating more excitement in the academic community and the business community <laughs> about the need for talented people to work in this field, particularly given terrorism and the, this whole new extension of your, of your workload. I mean, one thing for us is that we actually get quite a lot of volunteers who help us. So we have one group of about 5,000 people in London, you get around the country, who are specials. They put a uniform on and do the same job the police officers do with all the powers. We have another group who are un you know, without uniform volunteers, and which I think at the moment we've got about two, two and a half thousand. And some of them help us keep police stations open, they just keep a counter. You see it more in the rural areas. We've actually got some people who've got specialist skills. So we've got some people who are forensic accountants. That's their day job, and they come and help us when they're not at work. Uh, we have some people on the CCTV and image recognition side. So we've got a floor in the yard which does exactly what I've just talked about in terms of facial recognition. But often we've discovered that when the software doesn't work, we fall back on people and some people call super recognizers who seem to be able to be really helpful. So in the rights of 2011, we looked at a quarter of a million hours of footage and arrested 5,000 people, of which 70% were charged eventually, mainly on CCTV evidence. So these people helped us trawl this and we couldn't have paid for enough officers to do it. So I think you're entirely right. Where we can provide an opportunity for people, they will come and help, not always for payment, and be, uh, you know, get passionate about it. Uh, but I think there's something probably more that we could tap into. And in fact, uh, I was talking with the, the warden, and uh, he was talking about the point that, you know, in terms of the scientific community, how do we build them into thinking about how we might make the best of new ideas? Uh, I mean, the way that it sounds like GCHQ and perhaps other people are doing, and the police have probably missed a trick there. And I, you've made a suggestion as to how we take that forward. So I'm sure you're right that people want to help. They don't want to see bad guys get away with it. Yeah, could I just chip in there? Yeah. I just come back to, uh, the, just to remind you, as I'm sure you know, that it's not just shows, it's entire channels that could be devoted to this. And I'm thinking specifically of the O.J. Simpson case, which was the, that was the first time in the States that DNA went into every single person's living room. And there was a channel on there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, devoted to nothing but the O.J. Simpson trial, and most of that, of course, was DNA. Um, and I think that ran for about nine months, and I saw some of it. It was indescribably tedious. <laughs> 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 but a fascinating case, nevertheless. Was he guilty? <laughs> well, that suffice to say he was acquitted in the criminal trial. There was a civil case against him, and I think the jury took about you know, 24 hours flat to decide against him. So I'm sure they... There was a New York City police detective who was hired by the defense to investigate O.J. Simpson. Well-known New York City police detective who ran for Congress, a real character. And he spent a week on it to prove that he was innocent. And came back after a week and said, there is no doubt he's guilty. <laughs> well, uh, let, 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 me, let me tell you a very brief anecdote. I mean, uh, one of the, I won't name the company, but there was uh, one of the companies involved in providing DNA evidence there. I knew uh, the person who'd been doing the analysis very well. 
We actually met up before that trial even started. We met up at San Diego at the marina at 2 o'clock in the morning under a street light. I mean, it's pure John the Carrot. <laughs> and she was around the handbag with a bit of X-ray film. And that was the first DNA evidence. And I remember looking at it and saying, that is brilliant. That is a perfect match. And you'll never get a conviction for all the obvious reasons. I was right. Yes, question there. Oh. Thank you. Um, Sir Alec, you said 1 in 10 to the 13 um, as a probability that you, you would match uh, Sir Bernard. Um, would that it were so in the general use of DNA, which uses a very much more limited uh, matching process, commensurate with the finances available and that sort of thing. Um, I th had understood that one in t 10 to the seven was more likely with um, the normal fingerprinting as in, in the FBI's processes and so on. No, the, the, um, if we're talking about DNA, then the, the, uh, what we call the random match probability, that's the chance that you and I have exactly the same DNA profile, with the currently used system is about 10 to the minus 30. That's one in 10, whatever it is, trillion. Something like that. So some ridiculously small number. Uh, if you look at the system we've got in the States, uh, you can take that probability down by another factor of a million fold. So, but when you portray the rarity of this evidence in court, uh, the usual phrase is uh, one in a billion or less. And in fact, they mean one in 10 trillion. So the current system delivers far, far better than one in 10 million. It's one in 10 trillion. Believe it. Now, that number does change if you talk about close relatives. So, I mean, you can ask a, a very, very simple question. If we take the UK National Database, if it's that fantastically discriminating, every single person in the UK National Database should be different, have a different DNA profile. And you can do that test dead easily. Just compare everybody against everybody. Trillions of comparisons. And if you do that, and this was disclosed, I think, about two years ago, there are two instances of people who are not genetically identical who share the same DNA profile in there. And in both cases, they're brothers. If, if you're closely related, you're much more likely to share the same DNA profile. So if you look at that database, two examples of brother pairs who are not identical twins uh, but share exactly the same DNA profile. <coughs> and you can resolve them by additional DNA testing. Not a problem. So are we still talking about the actual complete match or just what is tested in the say 13 loci or whatever? No, I'm talking about what's tested in the 10 loci that are currently used. The chance that your, the chance that your DNA in its totality uh, matches anybody on the planet, whoever is or has been, whoever will be in the future, that is zero. That is inconceivable. And the reason for that is that the, if you look at the immensity of the, of the human genome, you can ask a very simple question, how many sites of variation are there between us? Um, across our genome? And the answer is millions upon millions upon millions. The chance of getting a match across the whole lot is just zero. It turns out even identical twins can be discriminated by DNA. So I, I don't understand that to be so in the case where what you're actually matching someone with is a degraded, mixed, oh, now poor we're quality sample. Right. No, that, that you, you, you're now raising an additional point about, about the quality of the DNA that you're trying to type. Now, with, with current typing systems, if you get a full DNA profile, I stand by everything that I've said. If you've got a mixed DNA sample from two different people, then the statistics become far more complex. And the power to associate a mixed DNA profile with a given individual becomes considerably less discriminating. That's absolutely true. If you have a badly degraded sample where you're struggling to get any DNA profile information out at all, and where it's incomplete, this is what we call low copy number evidence, uh, that could be positively um, non-discriminating in the extreme. So in that case, you're absolutely right. But if you're talking about a DNA sample that yields a, a complete DNA profile, then the numbers I said are correct. I think you know, the thing certainly for us is that it can be exclusionary, so it can exclude somebody from a crime, even if it's a you know, lower sort of you know, hit rate. The other thing is that often if you've got a degraded sample or a mixed sample is that the scientists will actually give the probability of it being you know, another person. So it might be one in a thousand, it might be one in a trillion. 
somewhere along that line, it may be helpful or it may be conclusive depending on the other, ev the other evidence. So someone has to explain in words of one syllable to a jury, mm -hmm. this is what it means. And then they have to make some balanced judgment. Um, either it may exclude them or it may not. It may include them, but with a certain level of probability. Uh, and many crime scenes are, are not perfect. So I think you have to use it as, as going back to where we started. It is not conclusive. It's a good indicator. It can never be more than that. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the other problem is, uh, we just pick up what Bernard said, is how you'll put, portray what is, in fact, an incredibly complicated branch of statistics in, in a, a sensible and rational way to lay people in a court of law. And that's a really difficult one. Um, so, for example, let, let's suppose uh, that I find a crime scene DNA sample and I have a suspect, and I, I check the two and I get a match. So I've got a one in 10 trillion. But I then need to modify that when I start thinking about maybe that's not the perpetrator, maybe he has a brother who's the true perpetrator. That will then change the statistics dramatically. Um, but then, let's suppose instead I hadn't, how did I find my suspect? Well, perhaps I did a comparison over an entire DNA database of five billion people. So what might be a one in a billion or one in a trillion match becomes much more likely, given the fact I've had five million attempts to get a match mm. uh, by looking over that database. So again, getting this subtle information across in the court of law is not easy. And it's very, very easy for the, the forensic scientist entirely inadvertently to mislead a jury by either overstating or in some cases completely understating the strength of the evidence. Any other questions? Uh, I heard a yes, but I can't see it. Oh, up in the back, there, yes. Yeah. Um, right, I find this stuff very interesting. I, just two, two questions. Firstly, if you've got um, brothers, you've got a complex crime scene, you've got a few brothers. Now, normally brothers share, should, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Right, we'll get, without getting too techy, the current typing systems um, make use of tetranucleotide repeats. So these are bits of, okay, get, let's get rid of the jargon. So, so the DNA is a string of letters, right, four different letters. Um, a tetranucleotide is simply four letters on the trot. And the bits of DNA that we look at are those four letters repeated over and over again. Stuttered DNA where the stutters vary from person to person, and it's very easy to measure uh, the number of stutters in a given individual. That's information that goes on to uh, the database. Um, most of the, these little stutter bits of DNA we look at are actually, for historical reasons, are in or near genes, but it doesn't matter whether you're inside a gene or a million miles away from a gene, uh, the Mendelian rule that um, there's a 50-50 chance that uh, brothers would share a given bit of DNA remains exactly the same. So that, that, that doesn't matter at all. So the far more challenging thing, of course, is the identical twins. So there's been, uh, now there was a burglary, I think, in Scotland where uh, they got crime scene DNA and it was, they had two identical twins. Okay, and they simply can't resolve those. Um, and so the That's defense. A good plot. It's a really good plot. No, this actually happened. So, so the defense of each twin is I didn't do it, my brother did it. Okay? Yes. Uh, bearing in mind that you've got to prove a case beyond reasonable doubt. Given the DNA evidence, you could go nowhere with it. So they're both acquitted. Now, there was also another really, really interesting case, civil case, of a paternity dispute where the two possible fathers were identical twins. <laughs> <All right. laughs> <laughs> okay, and believe it or not, that was cracked by DNA. You can do it. Would you like me to tell you how? <laughs> yeah, okay, right. So, identical twins, you start off with a fertilized egg. It divides into two cells. Now, at that point, one or two changes will have happened in that DNA, mutations, as the cells separate. Each of those cells then turns into a ball of cells and eventually into an adult human. So one of those twins was a true father, one wasn't. So what you look for are mutations in the child that they didn't get 
from the mother, so must have got from the father, but which only one of those two men had. And that, in fact, identified which of the two twins was true. Put some scale on this. That involved the readout of the entire genome uh, done to around about a trillion bases of red sequence per twin and the child and the mother and out of that vast quantity of information, huge amount, I think they had two single positions in the mm. DNA that gave the clue away mm. as to which of the identity of the twin. <laughs> and that cost thousands and thousands <laughs> and thousands. But, but just, just to stress that the power of modern DNA technology is unbelievable. Cost of DNA sequencing has come down by many orders of magnitude over the last six or seven years. R reading off entire genetic sequence of a human um, is down to a few thousand dollars now. It will soon be down to a thousand dollars. It's going to be recreational fun. So you're going to get your genome sequence, not for criminal investigations or medical reasons. Why? For genealogy, roots, your origins, who are you? How much Viking ancestry have you got in you? And so on and so forth. All that can be... Your, your DNA is a historical manuscript, and you can read it. And it doesn't cost a great deal to do the reading. So I'll make a prediction. If we're having this 10 years from now, and I put up a show of hands, how many people in the audience have had their entire genome sequence read? For recreational purposes, I would guess at least 10% of you will put your hand up. Anybody been done yet? Full sequence? No, it costs about $6,000 at most. Most of the people being done are... are, are um, uh, 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 celebrities. So, um, who's been done recently? Well, Desmond Tutu has been done. I think Angelina Jolie was done. It's Brad Pitt was done. It's the usual <laughs> sort of people you would imagine. Of <laughs> uh, 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 what they can actually divine from their DNA is probably good probably business rather. idea, though, for anyone who's no, just no, about no, to leave I mean, university. It, I'd say it's it's if if in the world of genealogy it is now big business. I mean, it, it is worth heaven knows how much per year worldwide. Because remember, there are all sorts of fun things you can do, like, um, and this may be of interest in the forensic context, is that uh, maybe you can extract your, or predict a person's name from their DNA. So crime scene DNA sample, and you read out the name. That'd be brilliant. And you're thinking, that is just stupid. That's ridiculous. <laughs> your name is not written in your DNA. Well, don't be so sure. Because there's one particular bit of DNA, that's the Y chromosome, that's inherited strictly down the male line, fathers to sons to grandsons, and also surnames are inherited down the same male line. So it therefore follows that there should be a correlation between your Y chromosome type and the surname you carry, and for rare surnames, that can work amazingly well. There's a good friend of mine, Mark Jobling at Leicester University, he's a world expert in this. So, for example, are there Atterboroughs here? Attenborough? No? Right. Well, if your surname is Attenborough, um, we can predict with 70% confidence what your Y chromosome will be. And it's a very rare Y chromosome as well. So if you find that Y chromosome at the scene of crime, and that can be tested, <laughs> that will tell you you're probably, even if you don't know who it is, it's probably an Attenborough. <laughs> <laughs> and that like actually idea, does work. Okay? And it also tells you something really interesting about Mrs. Attenborough's over history. They've on been the very faithful to their husbands. <laughs> 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 on that uplifting note, I'm afraid we, we have to come, it's come to an end. I yeah. could happily chat for another hour or two, and I'm sure we all could, but all good things come to an end. So I hope you'll join me in thanking Professor Slarek, Alec Jeffries, and Sir Bernard Hogan Howe on a truly fascinating conversation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So there are some more thank yous to come. I'm sure you would all agree with me that that's been a quite superb conversation. It's been amusing, entertaining, and really quite an enthralling tale that you've told. The, the big story for me, or the big theme, if you like, has been the way Alex science has reinforced and integrated with sort of the more traditional style of police craft that you tell us about, Bernard. A few things that caught my eye... I was particularly struck by the fact that you have a 94% detection rate for murder. I, I just felt the room sort of a, a bit go a bit electrified by that. 
And I was astonished also by, by Alec telling us the power of nations sharing DNA and the, the detections that, that result from that. So I want to thank people, but I usually start, Michael, with the moderator, because that was the job I used to have to do at the Royal Society. And I know how, well, how hard I found it, because I was constantly afraid that the conversation might dry up. So I was always on my toes, as it were. Now, I have to say I was also a bit nervous when you started, because you began with Merton's association with crime, and that, that sort of set the warden on edge. And then it got worse, because you spoke about Morse. And I have to tell you, I dissuade Mertonians from watching Morse because the, Merton, the, the warden of Merton turns out to be a paedophile. So, <laughs> anyway, after that little moment of anxiety, things got a lot better. So the first, somewhere in here, we have, that's it, we have a present for Michael, the moderator. Round of applause, please. Yeah. Thank you Congratulations. Very much. So now I turn to our two discussants, and I'll start with Alec. I am sure we were all fascinated by that moment of discovery that you told us about, and then riveted by the tales of the early applications. And it's lovely to know that they're going to be on television come Easter time. That's what you told us, isn't it? Yeah. So that, that's great. Bernard, you again set me on edge, I have to say, because you began with Merton's associations with crime. And, oh, here we go again. <laughs> Well, yeah, they weren't so bad this time. I mean, you know, so I was, I was nervous. It turned out it was a camera and a raincoat, and that's much better than having a warden who's a paedophile. So I thought, well, <laughs> that's not so bad then, is it? So can we have a round of applause for our two discussants? <laughs> there we are, Alec. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. <laughs> I should also like to thank you, the audience, A, for coming, and B, for being such an engaged audience. I would also like to draw your attention to a couple of upcoming events. We have got the meeting of the 1264 Society on Thursday, the 20th of November, at the Gallery Different in Fitzrovia. I hope you can find that. I don't know where that is. Then the final, the final anniversary campaign, the 750th campaign and London dinner, will, of course, take place on Friday the 5th of December at the Middle Temple Hall. You'll have Brian and myself and also, of course, a certain Bill Bryson. So, and, and Charles Manby, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yes, so don't, don't miss that. And now, finally... It's just a great pleasure to invite you all to join us for drinks and canapes in the following three rooms, which I have never yet managed to learn by heart. The library, the Georgian room, and the writing room. So we've got a choice of three rooms. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.